Children are the future. They are the voices of tomorrow, the harbingers of a new dawn. And if Xbox Live is any indication, a lot of them are assholes. Fuck you! I vote for the one in the frickin' chamber! <laughs> Kids these days have access to more video games than imaginable. If you got some shit laptop with a Wi-Fi connection, you can download Steam, make a profile, and for the price of a Big Mac and some fries, buy some of the best games ever made. Back in the 1990s, in the early days of the internet, video games as a medium had a massive barrier of entry. Look at this catalog from JC Penney's in 1995. You're telling me the Power Rangers Super Nintendo game was going for $69.99 in 1995 dollars? That's almost $140 today for this shit. Okay, granted, that game was fucking awesome, but still, $140 is a little bit ridiculous. I have a three-year-old daughter, and I'm sure there's many gamer parents like me out there who are wondering, how do I introduce my kid to gaming so that they can get the most out of the medium? Well, I'm going to take a stab at this incredibly difficult question by providing everyone with a list of games, old and new, that are fantastic experiences which can put your kids on the right path for gaming. This selection of 10 games not only showcases what I believe to be some of the best our medium has to offer, but also each provides younger gamers with legitimate life skills that will greatly help their development. So put away your CD-ROM of Jumpstart 3rd Grade, I'm here to tell you that you can make your child into a curious, empathetic, and organized young person who will be able to enjoy quality video games while avoiding a bunch of crap. But actually, don't throw away Jumpstart 2nd grade, because that game is the shit. I mean, look at this frog, you gotta put some stuff in the jukebox, and then he's gonna dance to the music. This frog is legit. I ain't never ran from nothing but the police. I ain't never ran from nothing but the police. Number one, Civilization. The year is 1994. The tenuous alliance between Rome and the Zulu has all but ruptured. On top of that, Gandhi has recently developed nuclear arms and is flaunting his newfound destructive power with wanton disregard for human life. War is on the horizon, and soon nuclear fire will engulf the continent. At least that was what 1994 was like for me! Between decimating Gandhi's nuclear arsenal and Nancy Kerrigan getting kneecapped, 1994 was crazy! Why? Why? Civilization is a great game for many reasons, but particularly in the 90s, it prepared me for a lot. Little did I know that my game of Civilization and the warmongering psychopaths in it would prepare me for reality of the 2020s. Now, Civilization is a fantastic game for kids to play for a multitude of reasons. First of all, the history. Oh my god, the history. Do you want your five-year-old to tell you about their new Fortnite skin they bought with your credit card? Or would you rather them have a cursory knowledge of some of the greatest leaders in history? Sure, they may think Gandhi is a warmongering nutjob, but hey, that's better than doing the Fortnite dance at the dinner table. Billy, get off the table! This is an Arby's! No one wants to see you flossing! I mean, I could recite all seven wonders of the ancient world by the time I was five, and who could blame me? You're telling me the Great Library grants me any technology that any two other civilizations have for free? Of course I'm going to learn about it. In all seriousness, Civilization is one of the best starting games for young gamers. Like many games on this list, Civilization starts out with a simplicity that even a child can understand. You need to build a city, then defend it, explore, and build more cities. But as the game progresses, these systems compound on top of one another, and you start to have to contend with other empires that have conflicting goals with your own. It teaches basic problem solving and strategic foresight without kids realizing it. Add on to that a rich amount of history and systems that reward forethought, and you have an experience that will leave a positive impact on any young person. Granted, if you overhear your child unleashing nuclear hellfire upon the world, do make a point to remind them it's just a game and maybe get them booked with a psychologist. Number two, Roller Coaster Tycoon. I promise this entire list is not going to be me just recommending old games, and I'm not going to be like a list YouTuber. I just had this idea in mind for a long time, but this is honestly one of the best games I have ever played. Now, back in 1999, this game was my shit. 
True story, I'm not joking about this. Every weekend between 1999 and 2001, I would sit in my dad's office on his big clunky computer with my massive stupid boombox next to me. I would listen to Now That's What I Call Music Volume 4 on repeat for 8 hours straight while diving into this fantastic game. And then I saw her face. This is one of the older games on the list that I'm recommending, and while it may be difficult to convince younger gamers to give it a chance because of its rudimentary graphics and the fact that modern park building games look a lot better, as you dive into this game, even now, over 20 years after it was released, the systems in it provide a better gameplay loop than any other park simulator to date. The thing about this game is that it allows the player to create within constraints, and for young children, I think this is a perfect environment for them. When children are developing, if you allow them to create without constraints, chances are they will make a bunch of shit. But if you introduce basic constraints, it will test them and force them to adapt and ultimately create something more satisfying. It's called art from adversity. Like, if you dump a bunch of blocks in front of your kid and tell them to build whatever, that may spark their creativity a little bit, but it won't help their problem-solving skills. Now, if instead you only give them a select few blocks and ask them to make you a house, they're going to start to use their reasoning to create something. And if you threaten to not feed them if they don't make something you like, they're going to work even harder and learn even more. It's called parenting. My point is, Roller Coaster Tycoon allows for a massive wealth of creativity within certain constraints. Sure, you can make a roller coaster that goes 150 miles an hour across hairpin turns, but no one will want to ride it, and that will mean you have less money to make more rides. Or you could plop down a park on a massive plot of land, but most of the scenarios limit the amount of land you can build on. The scenarios are perfectly tailored to reward a unique combination of creative thinking with strategy. Each and every scenario makes you think more creatively and forces you to weave your creations together to make a wonderful tapestry of pixelated glory. Add on top of this the fact that building roller coasters will provide your kids with rudimentary knowledge of physics and money management, and you have the recipe for a game that will imbue them with fantastic life skills early on. The only problem is that because this game was made in 1999, it only has a few different audio clips in it. And if you played Roller Coaster Tycoon back in the day, I guarantee you, you can hear that laugh sound effect that random guests would make when they were happy. <laughs> the downside of playing Roller Coaster Tycoon is that that and other sound effects will forever be stuck in your head. Now we got number three, Minecraft. Come on, could this list not have Minecraft on it? For decades, we have known that children who play with Legos are able to hone their creativity incredibly well, but it can be hard to supply kids with Legos when they are twice the cost of gold per ounce. $800 for the Millennium Falcon? Are you kidding me, Disney? That's 5.7 Power Rangers games. It's no surprise that the benefits of playing with Legos are naturally found in children that play Minecraft. Creating your own little world in a sandbox with fantastic progression as you learn more about how to build more complex things is a perfect recipe for inspiring children. And it also doesn't cost the price of a 2006 Chevy Cobalt LS with only 183,000 miles on it. Now, I played Minecraft for a couple months when it first came out of Alpha and liked building little houses, but now you have children building these massive empires or complex machines and all this crazy shit. Look, this guy even made it so you can play Minecraft in Minecraft. This game has an infinite learning curve where the more determined, organized, and creative your child is, the more rewarding the experience can be. It's infinitely replayable, and for a developing mind, it is one of the best games out there. Just do yourself a favor and don't let your kids go to Minecon unless you want them to become a meme. I was wondering, um, what's the recommended amount of dedicated wham I should have to serve? Or hey, no one be mean to Super Kai. He seems like a nice dude, and he had a great glow up. Number four, Breath of the Wild. 
Shigeru Miyamoto, the creator of the Zelda series and just about every other amazing game series out there, explained once that he took great inspiration from exploring the countryside of his homeland in Kyoto when he made Zelda. He talked about running around the fields and forests, finding little caves he would explore, and generally just being a curious kid. For kids, everything is new. I may look at the woods behind my house as just some place where teenagers go to get high, but for a young child there's so much more to be had there. What wonders lie beyond the trees? Where does the river flow? What could be found on the river's banks? Well, besides used condoms and cigarette butts. Breath of the Wild captures that childlike sense of wonder and exploration better than most any game out there. When you step out of the world, you're greeted with this massive vista that overlooks the land of Hyrule, and it's just begging you to discover all this world has hidden. I don't care how old you are when you first get this game, you feel like a child again as you step out into the world. What's that mountain in the distance? What are those big towers? You, you just have to explore and figure it out. Most of the time, all you're going to find is cruel, painful death because this game can be hard as hell. But hey, kids need a challenge to overcome. It'll give them grit. True story. When you start the game, the ghost of the King of Hyrule... Uh, oh, wait. Uh, I mean this random guy hanging out by this fire? Tells you to go east to Kakariko Village. This was my response. You think that we should go... That way? Yep. Well, then I'm going this way. After two hours of going in the complete opposite direction, I was in the desert dying of heat exhaustion and fighting giant sandworms. But the experience of just exploring was so fantastic that I didn't even care if I kept dying. I ended up playing the game for over 40 hours the first weekend I had it, and I don't regret a second. Give your kid the Joy-Con and I guarantee they'll fall in love with this title and have a desire to explore more virtual worlds. Number 5 City Skylines It's another game where you can create under constraints. Seeing a pattern here? I grew up when city building games looked like this and tried to build themselves as fairly realistic simulations. Do you know how fucking hard it is to determine tax rates and where to zone buildings and how to construct roads so traffic isn't an issue when you're 10 and the game looks like this? And now a volcano is erupting? Oh, fuck this. Just summon the robot to destroy the city. Now, city skylines can be quite difficult as you attempt to build a great city, but the management aspect of this game boils down to very simple sliders and making sure traffic doesn't get too bad. The game is great for little city planners, and just like Roller Coaster Tycoon, it forces them to build under constraints. And if your kid is too overwhelmed by all the possibilities at first, you can just turn on unlimited money so they can figure out the systems before jumping into a more realistic scenario. Number 6, The Sims. Traditionally, if you wanted to find out if your child was a psychopath, you would have to take them to multiple therapists and drop hundreds, if not thousands of dollars to get confirmation that they are clinically insane. These days, you can pop in a copy of The Sims, and if their first inclination is to murder these virtual people, you can have your answer inside of an afternoon, all for the low, low price of $870? Oh my god, for that price, you could buy a used 2006 Chevy Cobalt LS with only 183,000 miles on it. In my opinion, the gameplay loop of The Sims is near perfect for new gamers. There are so many tools available to the player and scores of different systems in the game, but anyone who picks up The Sims is already grounded with real-world knowledge. Everyone knows what a house looks like, or how it looks when people talk to each other, or that going to a job makes you enough money to live, unless you live in 2022, so that when you enter this virtual world, your challenge isn't discovering what the game has to offer, but rather understanding how to utilize the systems to make your dreams a reality. I remember spending hundreds of hours playing The Sims 1 on my family computer when I was a kid. It's a fantastic sandbox that sparks the imagination, and as your Sims move up in the world and get more money, your imagination only grows. So you make yourself in The Sims, and then you get your dream career as leader of the free world, you live in a mansion, then you make a Sim for the girl you have a crush on in 5th grade, and oh look at that, you can go in a bed and woohoo! You don't really know what that means, but oh man, the sim of your crush is kissing your sim and giving them gifts. How cool!
and don't deny that you haven't done this. Everyone makes themselves in The Sims to be an awesome player with a cool job and massive house when really you're just sitting in front of your computer in your underwear at 3 in the morning wondering how to get your cooking skill increased. You can make this horrible future a reality for your children for just $870. Number 7, Stardew Valley. Now we're getting into the teenage years, the time where hormones start to kick into overdrive and all that acne comes in and oh man, the big dance is coming up and Stacy Marshall's so hot, you should totally ask her to the dance. Oh man, here she comes, why am I so sweaty? I don't know what to say. As such, the games moving forward do have an element of maturity to them and take a more developed mind to fully appreciate. Starting off, we have Stardew Valley, the gameplay loop of Stardew Valley is phenomenal, where, like The Sims, you start off with jack shit. You're on a plot of dirt overrun by weeds and rocks, and eventually you can make a huge, beautiful farm that is highly profitable. But on top of that, you get to interact with a wide variety of unique personalities in the town. The reason I can't recommend this to young kids is because I feel like half the people of this town are whimsical, fun little caricatures of rural living, while the other half are degenerates with legitimate problems. Like one day you're talking to Harvey about how he's a doctor and a happy dude, then you meet Shane who has an alcohol addiction, or Pam who has an alcohol addiction, or Linus who has an alcohol addiction. This game is not realistic at all. People who live in the country don't have an alcohol problem, they have a meth problem. This game can really scratch an itch for young teens, where if you're a little bit more mature and interested in learning about the characters, you can have a fantastic experience. One real joy of this game is not simply making the best farm, but by befriending the townsfolk, you get to learn their stories and you can help them to be better people. You can get married and start a family and achieve the American dream of 1874 by having your own farm. Number eight, Final Fantasy VI. Another game that looks like shit. But if you think this looks like shit, you should see the remake. Look at those sprites, they're all lumpy and weird looking. Once kids get a little bit more mature, it's time to introduce them to stories and gameplay that raise empathy and causes them to think. A lot of the games before this focused on honing basic skills like strategic thinking and foresight, but now we're going to start to look at games that can provide emotional experiences that raise understanding. While there are plenty of Final Fantasy games out there that bring about strong emotional experiences which can grow empathy, I would argue that Final Fantasy VI is the most compelling of them all. And any Final Fantasy past Final Fantasy XI is a pile of garbage. Here's a 40 minute video why that's right. Fuck you Tetsuo Nomura! Didn't think I'd work you into this video, but I had to get the chance to tell you to go to hell. Final Fantasy VI is one of the most emotional Final Fantasies out there. However, that being said, if you didn't shed a tear when Eris died, you're not human. Oh geez, spoiler warning for a game released in 1997. I just ruined the most well-known death in video game history, I'm, I'm so sorry. This game has an absolutely massive cast of dynamic characters, all of which are going through their own issues while attempting to save the world. One great thing about this game is that it subverts expectations significantly. While most adventure games have you kill the villain and save the world, oh wait, uh, spoiler alert for a 28 year old game. Wait, 1994 was 28 years ago? I thought that was like 10 years ago. Anyway, halfway through the game, the villain actually wins and destroys the world. The characters have to live with their failure, and watching how they face their ruin is highly enticing. Some of them want to give up, others try to pick themselves up and get back into the fight, but I remember playing this game as a teen and loving how it showed that sometimes you fail, but you have to keep going. It's a great lesson for kids in a genre that's absolutely filled with the typical hero saves the world crap we've seen over and over again. Pair that with unique characters and the whole experience can cause developing minds to rethink traditional stories and understand how to push forward even when things don't work out. Number nine, the Mass Effect Trilogy. Now, here's a fantastic game in and of itself, but for teens, this game is an absolute must play. I grew up watching Star Trek, and I'm a huge advocate for exposing children to thoughtful sci-fi. The entire genre lends itself to introspection that helps development. You want to know my proof that sci-fi makes people smart? I can guarantee you Joe Rogan and Andrew Tate never watched Star Trek. 
They seem more like the sort of people who would cheer when someone turns on a lightsaber in Star Wars. This is where the fun begins. Yeah. <laughs> there can be no justice so long as laws are absolute. Would you choose one life over 1,000, sir? I refuse to let arithmetic decide questions like that. There are times, sir, when men of good conscience cannot blindly follow orders. It's bang out the machete, boom in her face, and then grip her up by the neck. Pair fantastic sci-fi with the branching decision choices in video games, and you have an experience that can significantly mold a developing mind. This game is a smorgasbord of all the right things we've seen in other entries. Unique and interesting characters that you have to spend time learning about? Check. A branching narrative that requires forethought and changes significantly due to the choices you make? Got that too. A race of blue space lesbians? Absolutely. This game perfectly captures the thoughtfulness of traditional sci-fi and puts it into a fantastic role-playing experience that has aged incredibly well. And now with the entire trilogy remastered and available for the low price of a Power Rangers game in 1995, there's no excuse not to get a younger generation into this experience. Number 10, Red Dead Redemption 2. Last but certainly not least is Red Dead Redemption 2. For older teens, this is one of the best gaming experiences you can expose them to. Now that they're a little bit older, kids of this age can appreciate the story of a more mature game and expose themselves to that sweet, sweet video game violence we all love. But unlike many other video games that offer these big blockbuster experiences with over-the-top action, Red Dead Redemption 2 has a story to it that is insanely engaging. Most games that rely on violence to sell units usually don't worry too much about having a great story, and as such, these experiences usually devolve to just mindlessly shooting endless amounts of enemies over and over again. Don't get me wrong, I'm not a prude against violence or anything, but at a certain point, jumping out of a plane to shoot people just isn't stimulating anymore. Red Dead Redemption 2 tells a story with some really heady themes of loss, suffering, and of course, redemption. For me to briefly summarize this game would be doing it a terrible disservice, but I can say without a shadow of a doubt, Red Dead Redemption 2 provides one of the most emotional experiences of any game I have ever played. Don't believe me? Here's an actual picture I took of myself during my second playthrough of the game, and at that part, I started shedding real tears again. And I'm not the only one who broke down and started crying over a virtual cowboy. I may just be a grumpy old man, but really I want my daughter to come into the medium with quality gaming experiences. So many kids just buy the newest game where you jump out of a plane and shoot people, and while that's fun for a time, it isn't really intellectually stimulating. No one who has played Warzone for months at a time ever walks away from the experience feeling better. In fact, most people who play this game seem to actively hate the experiences and themselves. I know that's not fair and I'm painting in black and white here and I really like some of the Call of Duty titles as well but I really want to see new gamers get attuned towards quality gaming experiences rather than the most recent fad because by playing those quality games it helps them grow and seek out more interesting gaming experiences. Now this list isn't exhaustive. There's plenty of great games that I omitted from my list like Portal or Skyrim or Tetris or Super Mario Brothers or, or any host of other games that are great for young gamers. But I would really love to hear from all of you. What games did you play when you were growing up that really made you enthusiastic about the medium and want to get into gaming more? Do you agree that kids should have deeper experiences with games, or are you wrong and think that it's okay to give Call of Duty to an 8 year old? Either way, let me know in the comments what games were really instrumental in your youth because I'd love to spark a discussion about this topic. I haven't seen a lot of other people discuss this online, so I think it would be great to really get a collection of games in the comments that are fantastic for young gamers. On one last note, I just wanted to really thank everybody for their support over the last month or so. Before my Majora's Mask video, I had maybe about 80 or 90 subscribers. Now it's up to 3,300 some. So I'm just very humbled by the support of the community and how everyone's really taken to that video. And I just wanna say, stay tuned. 
every month or so I'm going to try to make a long form video that focuses on a really interesting topic. And between those long videos, I'll sometimes pepper in some shorter funny videos. So stay tuned. Hopefully you like this video. If you didn't, we'll have more in the future. And I really look forward to seeing how this community grows. And I just want to say thank you so much to everyone. And I'm committed to making more quality content for you all. Thanks. Have a good one.